So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Price. I've been coming to this conference for six years now. And I say coming because my first year, I was actually in a, I attended. I was a delegate. I was registered. Because I had just started in December, and then the following February, I attended. In the last five years, I have been a part of what at the time was a committee, and then we transferred over to a working group. And for the last two years, I've been, I guess this is only my second year, that I've been taking the reins on our Builders Challenge that happens every Wednesday. So one of the things I thought of, and I wasn't really sure of that we had done in the past, but we, I thought it'd be a good idea to give a little precursor as to what we're doing on Wednesday in the Builders Challenge. And this year, um, I came up with the idea 362 days ago. It happened at the Thursday dinner where we all got a little drunk as we normally do as a working group and came up with this idea. So I've been with the Tribal Council five years. I help out, and I say help. Um, advise kind of doesn't work. So I help out with 10 First Nations with their housing infrastructure, housing management, policies, construction. I help a lot of band managers as well. Sometimes I get into the politics with chief and council, but typically it's band managers and housing managers. Um, I've been designing homes for eight years now. I was a qualified designer. And when it comes to what I've got to prepare or what I'm about to speak upon today is that I've actually done a deep energy retrofit on my own home. So some of the things you see later on as I explain, I've actually done to my own home. As well as the advanced framing portion, I've done up to, I think I'm up to 21 units now with advanced framing and some of the techniques that you'll see. So to get started, so this can be called advanced framing, or if you look online, some optimum value engineering. Advanced framing seems a whole lot easier. Kind of don't like the word engineering. So basically, this all originated back in the 60s as a way to reduce the amount of framing to a bare minimum, yet keeping structural strength and trying to keep framing costs down. Uh, NRCAN, National Research Council, around the 60s, I think it was called the permit, something along that lines of study, and it was very well done. And the gist of it is, again, to keep lumber to a bare minimum, and then there's attributes that go along with that. So less wood, you can install more insulation. With less wood, you're in harming less trees in a kind of roundabout way. One of the things that, once you start out with this, is that new techniques and procedures, it's going to get a little while. Um, so you will see a labor savings over time if you just take one approach. If you're not applying it, so say substituting, so you're taking out uh, framing labor and then adding more insulation to say the exterior, it's kind of a trade-off. So one of the somewhat cons of this is, is on my side of it, the design takes a little bit longer. The more details I put into a set of drawings, even to the point of doing stud layouts, framing plans like that with framing crews that aren't really aware of how this 24 center works, which I'll get into. There's not a lot of training for this. Um, a lot of what I've seen there is that framing crews get taught from generation, um, kind of the 16 center approach and uh, what they were taught, which is great. Don't get me wrong, but there's always more than one way to skin a cat. Some of the other major things is that this needs to be designed as a system as a whole. You need to look at the entire wall system, roof, possibly flooring, possibly foundation as an entire system and incorporate products that work as a whole. Uh, one of the big ones that a lot of people find out if they don't do this approach, the end that's uh, their siding get 24 inch on center. So one of the big things that I've promoted with my this type of framing 
is that not to take all of these details into one house. Start out with one thing with one house that you may have already done. So if you have a floor plan that you did last year, apply some of these techniques first. Don't dive into the deep end with all of these all at once because it can get pretty overwhelming. Because as soon as you start changing one thing, pretty much everything after that can change, and it will. So if you can take that into mind that if you start small and then progress through all of these details, you're going to have a lot less headaches and you're going to make mistakes no matter what. So to minimize your errors, start out small with little bits. So as I just already mentioned, one of the things with advanced framing is instead of 16 inch on center studs, walls, sometimes even flooring, foundations, is that you move up to 24 inch on center. Uh, insulation allows it and your trusses are typically framed in a lot of homes that I see at 24 inch on center. So this is also known as framing. So basically you have a truss directly over a wall member, a stud in this case. It can also work with floor systems, but I'll try and stick with just flooring, or sorry, walls and roofs, but it can be applied. So, so one of the things I get asked out in the field is um, what are the structural capabilities of just a two by four versus a two by six? Now the reason we typically pick two by sixes in this zone, in this climate, in this area, is for the extra depth for insulation. Structurally, a lot of the houses that I see in my communities are single story with a roof. There's no second story. They're all typically one single story with all two, three bedrooms, bath, and crawl space or foundation below. To give you an idea, that 24 on center versus six, you can still do a two by four can support a, a roof, a small attic load, your insulation, ceiling, can support uh, an a floor attic and then another, sorry, a roof attic and then another floor if need be at 24 on center, okay? So just by going from 16 to 24, you can still build basically what I've seen in my six years. One of the things that you can also remove is allowed in the code. You can go to single top plates. Um, there are a couple of rules that I'm going to caution you about. And the first one is, is that your stud length changes if you want the same wall height. If you still want the same foot, you're moving, removing. Therefore, your 92 and 5 eighths typical stud length isn't going to work anymore. So you can imagine cutting all of your studs out of eights, out of 96 inches to get your 94 and an eighth for the same wall height. The next things you need to be aware of with single top plates is that your, your stacked framing has to be within two inches. So here I've shown it at a maximum. So if I was to see this in the field, this would be kind of okay. And it would be, it would be allowed but if it starts veering more than two inches off of the load path, from truss to stud in this case, um, it's not allowed. One of the rules of thumb, it's a little easy to remember, is that if you're out more than a width of a stud, like an inch and a half, and I start seeing that in the field, I'll red flag it immediately. But this is one of the things you need to be aware of if you're going the route of single top plates. Another major one is joints. It's really hard to do a 24 by 36 house with a single top plate without having a joint somewhere. One of the things you need to incorporate into either the design or your framing, especially materials, the way you're laying it out, is that the joint in the top plate, if you're doing a single one, has to, the nice way to do it is to have it line up on a lintel somewhere, on a window lintel so that it ties in and you get the, min or the maximum number of nails that are identified in the building code to get the strength out of that top plate. There's two other approaches, but the other common one is connector plates. Um, rule is, is that you need three nails per side in the connector plate. So in this, you need six nails for that little piece of steel, so basically to lap the joint. But again, if you do it in a way, every house needs windows, and if you can lay 
then to a, a lintel layout, uh, I'd highly recommend that more than going out and getting something that's specially ordered or something that's not off the shelf. I'm going to down here a bit. I'm probably rushing through this. So Jan was just mentioning, again, in this photo, I've just left one wall in, but it works for both sides. So that your stud wall is the same on both sides. It's supporting the truss. I didn't draw it just for clarity, because it sort of mucks it up. But again, you'd want an opposing wall on the opposite side, supporting the truss the exact same way. Truss above every stud, within an inch and a half, two inches of the stud. And again, it shouldn't be hard to lay out your trusses up with every. Again, one of the things I already mentioned to you, I highly recommend um, that you keep double plates, double top plates as your first try. Um, it's kind of, there, again, there's a lot of little details besides just the three major ones that I just showed you for removing one top plate. So if you're going for it for your first try, try 24 centers, keeping your double top plates, your stud lengths stay the same. There's not much that's going to hurt you in big errors if you stay with your double top. So for the purposes of this, we're going to stay with double top plates, but again. So I was afraid of this. This is a house that we did recently. And it's really hard to see because of that light above. But basically, there's 24 inch on center roof trusses sitting directly above every stud at 24 inch on center. And again, I started out with this framing crew. Uh, I've been working with them for six years now. And for them, it was a matter of sitting down and explaining to them what 24 centers means, lining up with each stud. And I went as far as doing a stud layout on a wall on the floor plan for them, so that they knew where it was. So now that we have studs at 24 inches on center, there's several options. One of the great advantages of it is that you can fit windows inside these cavities with direct without having to add any lintels, without having to add any wood above it to support it. There's no roof load above. It's directly into that, what you would consider or what you would call your king stud on the outside of the opening. Now you just have a, a, ta or a, a header stud and a sill plate. And again, each of those would be nailed three, three and a half inch nails into each side. One of the things that's not allowed that I'll get into the reasoning, but basically it's lateral strength. Um, code doesn't allow and it's highly not recommended that you put windows in adjacent cavities. This way, there's not, you're allowed to attach cladding or interior finishes. And again, in this scenario, you would frame it similar to, which I'll get into, or as you would typically frame a window. You'd have a lintel above, your king studs on the side, and then your jack studs supporting your lintel, and then a sill below. So I've had this question come up in the field, well, why can't we? And I'll tell you why in a little bit. So one of the things that I do as a designer or have house layouts is that I incorporate stud that's supporting a roof truss as your king stud. So you frame your opening from that side, left or right, makes no difference. So that see here is that basically I've taken two cavities And there's a, a lintel above, and again, sill. The one thing you notice that's different is that the sill plate doesn't have the cripples below. One of the things that, but I'm hoping somebody in the front row might be able to help me out if they could tell me what they see there, if anybody 
notices a difference. So it's a single top plate, right? It's back to the detail that I showed you before with the, the lap joint. So you can get away with a single top plate. And again, so long as you adequately nail the lintel to the top plate and vice versa, this is allowed. The one on the left and then the one on the right is somewhat traditional. But a lot of what I see is they have the double top plate, then the lintel, then the opening. Another one of the things uh, when laying out windows is to take advantage of 16 inch on center. Uh, can anybody throw a wild guess as to why you would want to do that? What's that? Yep. As well as? Your insulation is 16 inch on center too, right? So if you can incorporate still 16 inch on center bays for ease of installation, for your insulation, right? But again, these details need to be identified someplace <laughs> in either a stud layout or, because otherwise it'll go missed, right? A framing crew might miss this detail or miss a stud here and there. So one of the things without having uh, jack studs, because typically in framing there's a stud that supports this lintel right next to it. Um, one of the things that I learned from last year's Builder's Challenge was to try and incorporate materials and techniques, or especially materials, sorry, that are off the shelf, that you can get readily available at any home center. We kind of made a mistake last year with these metal hangers that completely didn't work. But here I am again, standing in front of you, recommending um, to remove a jack stud and to order um, what they call a header hanger. Um, this removes, again, your jack stud. And just like any other metal, like joist hanger or framing tie, these have limitations. Um, depending on if it's holding up two stories or a single story in a roof, uh, two stories in a roof or other loading options, you'll need to work uh, with the designer and they'll have to spec it because there's different framing, uh, sorry not, there's different fasteners that can be supplied to get you increased strength to increase the span of the lintel so that these aren't overloaded. So one of the things that's been a huge pet peeve of mine ever since I started with the Tribal Council was going into a set of plans, reviewing it, and there's always that generic note that says every opening, two two by tens, spruce pine fir. That's it. For your doors, for your two foot windows, for your three foot windows, for your five foot windows. And again, they put it on there as an ease of use. Like it'll work for a five foot window. Well, of course it's gonna work for a three foot door. And same thing with a three foot window. So to reduce the amount of framing um, it, I advise, again, I suggest you spec the lintel for the size of the opening. Whether there's a roof load, whether it's a gable end, whether you can get away with a lint without having lintels on gables, whether there is a snow load. Those type of scenarios. It removes a lot of wood and sometimes even labor by specking um, whether there's a lintel or not, whether it's a 2x4 or 2x6 or And one of the things I, this is actually a photo from a site that the guys were doing and I thought it was ingenious and I never really thought of it before, but they had a bunch of, I think those are tens anyways, but um, they basically just two by tens and then cut them to length on a chop saw. So they got all their two by tens, laminated, screwed all together and then laid out their screw pattern and then they just basically cut the lintel length rather than just cut wood, then the insulation, then basically build a, a massive lintel 
and then cut that into smaller pieces versus cutting a bunch of small little members and screwing those all together. It seemed like a huge time saver to me, and I was thoroughly impressed with it. <laughs> so as I mentioned with window openings, the same rules can apply to, to door openings. Apply your door, you can see on this side, so this is your king underneath the truss, and here's another little support above a lintel with two hangers, and here's your extra stud. And it can work both ways, left to right, right to left, it doesn't matter. So long as your framing crew and your designer are on board to understand that, yes, I don't need a jack stud, this king, this full stud is where the opening starts, and here's where it ends. So this is kind of representation of what I have seen in the past to what I've seen a couple of framing crews do now. The only difference is, is that none of my crews are doing single top plates yet. And they don't do that little. But you can see visually the difference going from 24 to 16 and then laying out doors and windows using studs that are already there bearing load. Now I'm kind of flying through this. Does anybody have any questions so far before I keep going and progressing and just standing up here talking? <laughs> yes? Okay, so his question was, how much money would you save going from 16, 20, just basically what I've shown you so far. And to be perfectly blunt with you, in the first while, you're not going to save anything. You're going to spend just as much time trying to figure it out until you get good at it that you're going to start saving money. Because in the beginning, you're going to make mistakes with suppliers, with designers, with other things that are going to come up in, in the layout. It's only when you get one community is on their third house and they're starting to notice a savings in time where the material, they, they substitute it, right? It's the savings they went with wood, they've incorporated it into spray foam insulation. So one of the research, again, I read, it's typically, again, four bedroom home, I think there was a research paper, it was like a thousand, just over a thousand dollars they save in framing materials. Again, it would be on a case-by-case -case basis, though. Like, a, you could do the, the math on a, again, home that you did in the past, right? You could even call the supplier, whoever it is, and say, hey, yeah, if we went to 24 on centers, what would it be? But I bet you any money, if you went to home hardware and they asked for a package, they would still send you king studs and jack studs and lintels and 2 by 10s and, yes, Trevor? I was hoping you were, but okay. I was hoping you'd cover the science bit of it, and then I would carry the, okay. So now that we've gone from 16 to 24, we've saved some lumber on the walls, openings. We can move on to details like exterior, outside corners, inside corners. Um, at the top is typically what I was seeing in the beginning, three stud corner, basically allows cold air, thermal bridging to go for it through the envelope. This corner detail still does, but it's better performance. And basically, this stud, this one, and wow, is my hand ever, they're basically nailers, right? This is a drywall nailer. It's not structural. Um, again, if you have strapping options, you have smaller dimensional, so you can get, you can reduce this from an inch and a half to three quarter. Uh, one of the things, if you start doing a little more research, is a lot of 
test studies and papers, they went full bore and they recommend um, these things called drywall clips. And the last detail shows it here, where this piece of drywall is screwed into this and then there's a clip like so that attaches to the framing member and you screw the drywall into that. Um, again, as I mentioned before, I don't recommend you um, special ordering these things. As far as I know, I haven't seen these sitting on a rack somewhere at any of my building or ready available anywhere yet. Um, but you can get strapping 1x4, 1x6 nailers to do the same thing that are readily available. You can get at any home center. But I thought you'd be aware of, of this. So the next bit of framing saving that we can do is interior partitions. Now this one, kind of my favorite, and it doesn't really matter where this partition is. This one by six strapping behind it can move, so this wall can move anywhere along here and you can nail drywall to it, because that's basically what it is. Uh, the next one that you commonly uh, see in all the details is, again, a one by four nailer, but it's laid horizontally at 24 inch on center, so you have like 24, 48, six feet, and then you have your top and bottom for your drywall, and that's adequate. And again, um, I was seeing this in the field horizontally by fours or two by sixes, whatever it was had. But if you start getting into using more strapping, you might have enough, or if it's planned to have enough lying around, that you'll be able to use this out of waste. It might work out. <laughs> so. We have corners, walls, roof. Now what do we have for sheathing options on the outside of the wall? Um, there's another option here uh, that I'm not going to mention because it's kind of counterproductive for really far north communities. And these are the four that are the most readily available at pretty much every home center. Um, in the, so at 24 inch on center, you're allowed half inch OSB, which we know you can't get. It's seven whatever. 16th, but again, that's the minimum. And then half inch exterior plywood. You can even use dimensional lumber if you want. Uh, the other one, and I'll get into expanded and extruded, is rigid insulation. So you can use uh, expanded or extruded. So the thickness, if you're using expanded, is an inch and a half. If you're using extruded, the minimum's an inch. Now what I mean by the last bullet, by none, is that a lot of people think of sheathing as a wood product, right? They think of like that layer of plywood, that layer of OSB is typically what I see all the time on the exterior face of your stud walls. So there is an option, and again, it's actually the very first option in, if you were to read the building code, to not use any. So before we get into that, here's basically a, an illustration of the difference between expanded and extruded. Um, I see this, basically just the popcorn insulation <laughs> type. And again, the difference between the two is density and their rated use. Um, and the R value and its chemical properties and so, but again, it's kind of confusing, and if you were to read it in a the chart, they call it type 1 and 2 and type 3 and 4. But again, when you go to the home center, they typically call it expanded or extruded. So I wanted to put it all out there and then give you a visual. So as I had said before, one of your options is not to use a wood sheathing on the exterior of your house for lateral strength. So at 24 on center, you can use diagonal bracing. Um, and here are the general rules of installation. 
It has to be a 1 by 4 at a minimum. I, I believe it's a min. But anyway, at 45 degrees, let in from the bottom plate to the top plate. So whether you're using a single or a double, it has to be into one of those plates. You have to nail it two, two and a half inch nails every stud in every plate. Um, I've had a question whether that would split. I haven't heard of it splitting yet when you let it into the stud, but we'll find out tomorrow. <laughs> I haven't heard any instances of it splitting yet. Um, if you have a two story home, your diagonal bracing has to be every story and every wall. So you have a four single story, four wall house, which I see 95% of the time, you just need four diagonal braces. Um, I researched this for a while when this first came up, when I first started designing this, and everybody was like, well, how long between braces can you go? And again, the only general rule of thumb, unless somebody can correct me, was that it wasn't recommended to go past 24 feet. So an unbraced diagonal braced wall past 24 feet as a general guide. Um, I haven't seen a lot of uh, homes over 48 feet long, which is basically what it would be, right? If you stuck a brace in the middle of a 48 foot long wall, you have an unbraced length of in the 20s. But yeah, as soon as you start getting into building really long buildings past 48, 50, 64 feet, um, you might want to, yeah, start throwing in some additional cross bracing. So the cross bracing itself is, uh, works in conjunction with your interior finish. Um, drywall, hardboard, I always see drywall, so that's always the first thing. Whatever interior finish, it's, that's what it works in combination with to prevent the building to go from, like, just basically side to side along its long length. Uh, one of the things, I think I'm supposed to say it here, if I remember my notes, is that uh, when you're framing uh, two stories and you're at the point of putting a roof on a house framed like this, you are, or even single story, they didn't notice it as much, but two story, you'll really notice um, the building move along its long axis. Like if you have a 24 by 48, you'll notice it move a lot after two stories along 48 feet. And it gets a bit, actually it gets a really unnerving because the guys in the field phone me up and they're like, is it really supposed to move this much? And I was like, well, you basically just have tacked on rigid insulation on the outside. There's no OSB on the outside. There's no drywall on the inside. They have these, it was a 24, 36, two story. So they only had like eight braces, four per story basically stopping it from going like this along 48 feet. So one of the things uh, that they did was they braced it temporarily a little more along the 48 feet to prevent the building, just so it didn't feel as unnerving up there at two, two and a bit stories at a 412 pitch from going like this while they were roofing. So it's, you need to keep that in mind. One of the things I was thinking about uh, afterwards, whether there's a time and period whether you can install some drywall on the inside once the exterior foam or siding is up so that when you're up on the roof or you're uh, at a point where the drywall is not going to get destroyed, that the building's a little more rigid so while you're up there at higher heights, you're not going to be as scared because I guarantee it's going to feel really unnerving for the first time that you go up there. And if you're unnerved at one story, 24 or 36 at one story, well, yeah, crank it up another level and then. So the other types of uh, cross bracing that are available, again, special order across the board from what I've seen, uh, nobody stocked these items, but it saves a little bit on time and labor is that these can be installed with just a single saw cut at basically the same way. It's installed at 45 degrees, two nails per stud, two nails per top plate. But again, it's just a single 45 degree saw cut from bottom to top and then nail it in. You're not cutting it, notching it, and then installing it. 
So it saves a little time, but again, it's a custom order item that achieves the same thing. <laughs> so from here, um, we're going to move on to uh, rigid insulation as a sheathing. And I'm going to focus on uh, two aspects of it. When we, this discussion started, I guess, 362 days ago, um, the Canadian market was a lot different. And for communities in the Kenora area, I'm not sure if Mark's community is in Fort Francis. I know some of the Thumb Thunder Bay area communities were taking care or taking advantage of this. But they were buying rigid insulation out of the states for half the price that they were in Canada when the Canadian dollar was at par, basically, right? And now that it's vice versa, it's not as beneficial. They we were going to the extreme of uh, one of my communities, they were installing slab on grades. Like, they were putting two inches of insulation under slabs and frost-protected footings and getting all this beautiful rigid insulation at four by eight sheets at the same price as they were going to their hardware store down the street for two by eight sheets. So when this all started, <laughs> this was very an a very, very economical way to insulate a home. And now with, now you're getting a two by eight sheet of two inch at $32. Again, where we were getting it at four by eight for $29.95. So, I would do Rigid insulation on the exterior. Well, one of the things is that um, it reduces the thermal bridging. You have a complete thermal break blanket of insulation around the exterior of your building. One of the things I was hoping Trevor was going to cover was that with the insulation on the exterior face, um, it moves uh, the dew point closer towards that rigid insulation, which means that your structure can stay drier so long as you have a healthy indoor air quality. A wet building is going to be a wet building regardless of whether you install a, a little bit of insulation on the exterior of a building. You need, this, isn't, this is a thermal or a, a guide to reduce heating load, basically. And since 10? 2010, 2012, um, they increased the energy requirement for, I think, just about everybody here um, and their homes for residential heating days in this climate zone to go from an R20, whatever it was, when I first started, to an R30 wall. So this, again, I'm not 100% sure if it applies to the Sudbury area, if anybody from here. but. Again, I know it applies to mine, fly-ins. Electric heating went from R20, whatever, to now it's R30. And this is one of the, the ways of doing that. Two by six wall with exterior foam insulation. So what are the disadvantages of rigid insulation? As I mentioned before, market was really good this time last year, insulation out of the States. Now, again, $30 a sheet in Kenora for 2 by 8 um, Some of the techniques and training. Again, you're going to make mistakes with this because adding an inch or two inches or three inches or whatever you add to the changes a lot of things, how you install siding, how you install strapping, cost, labor. Some of the details get a lot more complicated um, around windows and doors. I shouldn't say a lot. Um, I believe, and it advised communities, and I believe it's actually mandatory now in their installation to install windows the way I'm going to sort of show you a peek of. So here's a common uh, way of building a wall with up to one inch extruded exterior rigid insulation. So you have your typical interior finish, drywall, hardboard, whatever you're doing. Mill poly, 
on the inside after that, and then from two by six typically, um, and then your type of insulation. Um, my communities typically use BAT, um, and they're starting to move towards cellulose and having a nightmare with it because the learning curve. Let's try cavity cellulose inside like wall cavities yet in their homes? Is everybody still working with bad insulation? No. Derek, you don't count. <laughs> so if everybody's still using bat, we'll just say two by six, bat framing. After that, again, typically what would happen after your framing would be OSB, Tyvek, type hard. And this, okay, here it is again. Is that we omit sheathing and install one inch rigid insulation. Um, from there, you install it uh, with tape seams uh, to prevent air leakage and a bunch of other things that I could talk days about. <laughs> Here's a detail that I wanted you to have for two inch rigid insulation on the outside. Your inside's the same, interior finish, whatever you want. Vapor barrier, stud, bat. And I did that number that's supposed to say two inches of rigid And then tape seams. And then from there, your vertical strapping um, for your siding or exterior finish, whatever. One of the questions I get with this detail is that uh, should I apply Tyvek, Tipar, house wrap, whatever you want to call it, to the exterior face of the rigid insulation? Um, you talk to manufacturers who make rigid, and they'll tell you has passed uh, a weather barrier test. Uh, there's a special adherence to it. Uh, last time I had checked, Dow had, I'm sure Owens Corning has by now, to omit, uh, again, a tie par over top of that. Again, you're treating this, this rigid insulation surface as your, again, what the code would call a secondary weather barrier. So your strapping options. So before I get to that, um, there's no real guide for what you should be using for strapping. Uh, what the, a lot of people have tried is that they said, well, we need to minimize wood, so we'll use a one by three strapping. And again, that's typically not readily available. And what they found was that it'll split just about every time, no matter what the spacing is, how you nail it, whatever. So do not use one by three strapping. Move up to one by four as a bare minimum, and then one by six in some of the details, interior corners, exterior corners, which we'll see. And if you have another good practice, yeah, is ripping plot, odd framing, exterior corners. And I'll show you a detail about plywood. So one of the things, again, working with uh, Dow, frantically in like the last month, as we had a little debate about this, uh, their installation tips. This is what uh, the crews in the field, as well as I personally have found, you use as little fasteners as you can to install insulation. Um, you don't want to be putting a whole bunch of holes in this weather barrier and sometimes an air barrier and that. So you basically, if you hang it, tape it so that it's up there, bing, do the work. Or install your siding right away if you're only using an inch. So one of the things in Canada that's hard to get is four by eight sheets. It's possible, but two by eight is usually off the shelf, off the rack. Um, but if you can get four by eight, again, it's less joints, less seams, less chance of joints, chance, less labor installing it, right? Uh, we, Dow and I got in a little debate, horizontal versus vertical. Um, this is kind of depends on a lot of factors. If you're, again, the height of the insulation is kind of a factor. So the type of foundation, uh, your wall, single story, 
Eve height. It's on whether this will be more economical to install horizontal or vertical. But basically, you just want to limit the vertical. And if you're doing more than one layer, and they don't recommend maximize the number of layers or maximize your thickness per layer. So if you want to install two inches, buy a two inch. If you want to install, this is what Dow recommends. I don't recommend it. I recommend doing multiple layers, but they'll tell you otherwise because you can offset seams and make it more airtight. Um, but again, you're paying more to put labor-wise to install those multiple layers, right? Go through each layer, you need to mark out where your studs are and keep track of them. Because if you're only nailing, putting two nails in each sheet or whatever it is just to hang it up there, you're going to lose track of these things. As I found out personally, I've nailed and screwed until I cursed and cursed and cursed. So this is a this we did in Wabagoon. And this is kind of the detail that we'll see tomorrow. Um, strapping is needed basically for your exterior finish. And it also allows an airspace for uh, making your siding last longer, whatever that may be. The issue with it is, as I mentioned very often in the beginning, was that one of the cons of this is a lot of siding doesn't work. This is that um, cavities and walls homes for insects, rodents, especially bats. Bats love these nice warm siding. So you have to install some sort of barrier at the bottom that's continuous so that you don't have bugs crawling up into your wall cavity and bats. The, the feces from bats are really bad as well as other rodents. So there needs to be sort of they, they can't basically live in that cavity. The easiest way to do this is basically off the rack uh, screen mesh that in your screen or your uh, screen doors comes in nice little 12, 24, 36 inch wide rolls. And even if you get, they're doing a lot of homes, a 12 inch roll will do you great. Buy a 12 inch roll and it'll last you quite a long time. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So every so the question was uh, whether you tape every joint, whether you're overlapping. So I'm thinking that you're sort of saying that if you install one layer, right, would you tape it and then apply a second layer? <laughs> Basically, yeah. The more time you spend sealing it, the more airtight it's going to be, and the, the more weather tight it's going to be. So I wanted to put this, need to go through it base by, piece by piece, but basically strapping spaced at 24 inch on quickly. So within the bottom so that it doesn't split, and then from the top when it doesn't split. And again, this is a table for all types of sidings, but basically I vinyl siding, fiber cement, are kind of the two that I see a lot in my communities now. I don't see a lot of stucco and, like I said, just in here, don't even think about attaching brick to a, to a strapping. And there are stackable brick products out there that you can do this with that don't require a mortar and, but again, read the instructions because it'll just the wall. <laughs> So here's some options. Um, some of these are pretty pricey. Some of them are pretty off the rack. Um, the one that I left out here, green treated deck screws, is another option. Um, the fastener, these here, I'm starting to see more and more, like in home hardware, starting to stock these now. Um, these ones are available at Home Depot. These ones I haven't seen in Canada yet, but again, they're kind of the same as this. 
I use these personally and try to bucket of these expensive and these are a joy uh, Torx head on them versus a, a yellow Robertson head on like the yellow screw and the Torx head is just you just stand there with like one hand and just put and the things just go in like a breeze and again if you have a large number of these it's it can be worth the time to purchasing them but again they'll be special order at again home hardware's remotes the main thing is is the length of the screw uh, depends thickness of the insulation the strapping and you need a minimum of an inch and a half into the studs below so to keep that in mind again the length of the screw varies depending on the insulation and the strapping. Actually, the strapping is always three quarters of an inch. So again, one of the things I mentioned off the beginning, siding options is kind of a limiting factor. Four inch on center. The, there's two papers out there relating to the installation of vinyl siding. There's one paper that says you can install vinyl siding at 24 inch on center over a masonry wall with strapping. They won't allow you to install vinyl siding in their manual, in their instruction manual, it says spacing not more than 16 inches on center into structure. So depending on what you read, um, but typically everyone that I've seen so far, and I've had, again, pick a home hardware, McMahon, whatever it is in the home art or yeah home depot um, these are the ones that I've seen throughout six years uh, one of the new ones I've started specking on a lot of homes uh, are these two products um, the LP again both of these will be special order depending on your quantities you can't just go down to the lumber yard and pick these up you spec for your home, which again, I highly, highly recommend that you do when the design comes out. Uh, LP makes a four by eight finished sheet that works at 24 inch on center, and it goes up like a dream. And then a hardy board, hardy cement, two products. Again, the sheet product is actually a little difficult, more difficult to install than the LP. But again, their horizontal siding is cement based. And again, it's, there's some finicky installation with it relating to concrete dust and respiratory. And so, but again, you'll need to do your research once you start implementing. So one of the last little things that I'm just going to throw here and sort of place in your minds, um, these can get pretty complicated depending on what you choose. Um, windows, when you're installing insulation on the outside, of course the jam doesn't really work anymore with the standard 2x6 and OSB. And so your interior jam changes as well as when you're renovating and say you remove the siding, you have the opportunity to add insulation but you don't really want to change your windows. Well, there's opportunity to add insulation and turn the window into an innie. But when you're installing new windows, it's recommended it's a little easier to install it as an Audi, like you typically. And this is a, this is a bad photo. This is, I wouldn't recommend that. You'll see why. So this I wanted to show you. It's a really kind of cutaway. First thing you Google, uh, any window. A lot of these details are finished. Like you're never gonna, I've never seen in my life uh, like wood shake siding in any of my houses. But again, the rules same apply depending on whatever the finish is. I'll sort of skip over this because again, it's going to be available. There's better. So this is one of the hardest details to get within an A is the sill detail with an existing window because you need to consider planes of water. Uh, water ingress and one of the things that I've heard I haven't heard it personally but window manufacturers will tell you that every window will leak eventually 
So you have to plan for water ingress no matter what. And again, it's in their new, new-ish, it's been years, I guess, installation instructions. So here you can see how water from the exterior would get out, if there was water that got behind certain elements, how it would get out, and then how it would escape into this being our wall cavity, right, with our strapping. Again, this is typical any in any windows for uh, removing siding, insulation, that type of scenario. So here's an Audi window, and it's kind of the same as what you do now. So you basically strap, provide support for the through jam box or boxes that I'll show you in a second, and then you can. What you do on the inside is kind of kind of up to you. Jam extensions may So this is a example of what you may get into with Audi. You're gonna have to incorporate openings or uh, the framing or possibly uh, strap once you get past that one inch. And here's another way um, at a house in Kenora where they made, they spec so they could rip block for them all in a day just using glue from the exterior that you would attach your window to. So rather than strap it and then put your attach that, they had just basically a guy installer just doing this in a day with plywood. So here's uh, one of the details that I like out of my to the window install. And one of the things that the keen eyes get right. Um, like the, they call this blue skin, but it's basically a, any type of self-sealing membrane. And this is the way they recommend installing windows in their installation. And I see this only about 25%. One of the things you notice here is that there's no membrane covering that bottom nailing fin. Um, typically in the past, people would install a window or sorry, OSB sheathing, install your window, and seal the perimeter. Now in the installation instructions, there are beveled sills uh, to prevent, to have the water slope out. You cover that sill in a membrane such as this, and then there's even details depending on the siding to have this plane come out over top of your siding. So you have all that water that the window manufacturer will tell you will happen come out over top of your siding or wind up in, depending on the detail, wind up in this cavity and then escaping through that bug screen. So just by adding insulation and listening to me yammer on for two hours, <laughs> things can get a little bit more complicated. So here is a window installation at one of my Communities, the header detail. Uh, I learned this the hard way of not sealing this joint between the, the basically the plywood box that goes around an Audi window. And it, what happens is, is that water will come down your rigid insulation into the top of the strapping joint and then wind up inside the house. And again, I learned that the hard way. So don't do that. There's other Similar details to this that, again, you have to work with uh, crews to basically stop water from getting in around your windows. And that's it. That was a lot of precursor for what we're going to be doing all day tomorrow. Now, before you all take off for the evening, I just have, if there are any questions, comments, Everybody sign up for the Builder's Challenge tomorrow. There's got to be a sign-up sheet here somewhere. We always run around in the morning trying to find people. 
And then even as I say that, we still wind up having people sign up and we run around chasing them down. I see a couple of familiar faces that sort of participate every year. I really hope we get a lot of participation. It's always a good time. Come out, cheer on. Are there any questions? Yes? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So you remove, again, it's three quarters of an inch, right? It's strapping. So it's letting it in so that your insulation is flush, right? So your exterior finish. It's recommended that over versus installing a three quarter inch material to the width of the strapping, right? Because you could apply the diagonal brace to the face of the studs and then install something three quarters of an inch thick, like say rigid insulation or, and then install another layer of insulation if you wanted, right? Three quarter inch insulation isn't a stock item. And you get a lot more strength uh, letting in the brace properly, letting it in tight um, that way. And yes, once you let in the brace, there's less likely that it's going to split, right? 